to News Click. Um, this is the second episode of Signs of Our Time with Professor Ejaz Ahmed. Professor Ejaz Ahmed is one of the world's most important Marxist intellectuals, and we're happy to have this series with him. Welcome to News Click, Ejaz. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, the world seems to be on fire after the terrible death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, there have been protests, not only within the United States, but around the world, as people are really outraged by what they're seeing. Could you reflect a little bit on the death of Mr. George Floyd and you know, the level of unrest about the role of the police in American society? One thing uh, that occurs to me is, of course, it has been boiling. Um, American police is in the habit of killing one black person per week on an average. Uh, typically a man, but they also have killed women. Uh, and that has been just building up. Uh, Ferguson was the earlier episode where the, again, there was a very large uprising and all that which gave rise to the organization of uh, the uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. So one of it is, that one of the things is that it has been building more recently. Uh, secondly, the, these are cyclical things that happened in America. I have, uh, when I was living here in the 70s, um, the same sort of thing of extreme police brutality. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes covertly it would be staged as a non-police person killing and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and great protests around that and so on. So part of it is that cyclical. Um, the third uh, thing that uh, seems to me is that, uh, and that is where the difficulty, I think, is in comprehending that the, you know, everyone talks about white supremacy as if it was something pathological out there from which X number of people suffer. Joe Biden just said 13 to 15 percent of um, of Americans are bad people, whatever that means. But, you know, as if it's out there. Now, white supremacy is second skin to in racial societies. And a lot of these police are white supremacists running around with guns. Thirdly, uh, or whatever, in order for them to do the kind of controlling of populations that they are required to do, they are also given a great deal of protection that they can get away with anything. And they expect that this is their right. Uh, one of the very significant events in my view that just uh, happened is there is a video there is an older man who's an old activist, which must have been known, a white man, who must have been known to the police because uh, he's an old man and he has been doing this in, in Buffalo for some 30, 40 years. He must be well known. On video, the two policemen push him. He falls down, hits his head somewhere. After much reluctance, the police department takes action against those two and 57 of his colleagues resign from duty in solidarity with those two men who have been seen on video doing this. So this is a kind of a privilege that the police has and has been given. Uh, <clears throat> Um, which is just part of the routines of American life. And those policemen are now very surprised why something is happening to them now. 
You know, I have a picture, I just, uh, from Long Beach, not very far away from where I'm sitting, where there's a black man standing, his little daughter is sit sitting on his shoulders. She's that small, she's sitting on his shoulders. And there's a white policeman with a gun aimed at that child, hardly a foot away. And it's open. And it's in the middle of a demonstration. And by now they know that someone or the other will take a picture or a video or whatever. So there's a kind of an impunity granted to the police force in this country and in most countries, uh, which itself needs to be scrutinized as part of how capitalist societies actually function. In America now, you're at a particularly delicate moment because you have a president who is, whose work is incitement incitement of violence, incitement of, you know, these good men who uh, took over, you know, these white supremacists and so on and so forth, who is deploying the army in the capital, in Washington, D.C., to, against peaceful demonstrations, with head of the American, with the joint chief of joint uh, staff is with him. So, you know, um, I have seen the United States in the early 70s during the Vietnam War movement when they were immensely larger um, gatherings. Uh, but this kind of display of military power that he's staging this kind of incitement, open incitement to uh, white supremacists, to, to white militias, and so on. So it's also a particular moment in, in the United States, which is making it much worse. And the more he inflames the situation, the more people are upset. People are also very upset because they have no way now left in America at this moment to register their protests or they can't look to the Democratic Party to represent them. So these are the unrepresented. Unrepresented in the belly of this so-called democratic society who are not represented by anyone and so on. So, so you know, there's all of this boiling over in this country. I want to pick up on um, the point you made earlier, which is about the role of the police in a capitalist society. Uh, you had mentioned that, you know, there is a specific charge that the police has in, in, a, in a society where private property is, you know, one of the most inviolable laws is the defense of private property and so on. Um, the United States is a very particular kind of capitalist society because it ends up incarcerating, you know, the highest percentage of uh, people on the planet is incarcerated in the United States. Frankly, I can't tell the difference between a regular police officer and a military fellow. They all seem to look the same now and so on. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the, perhaps the role of the police in a capitalist society. You see, there are capitalists, I'll come to, to capitalist societies in general, uh, but about the United States, I, let me just say this, that in the United States, there is a very particular kind of ideology of always being at the frontier, the conquest of the frontier, the masculinity tied up to your gun, the possession of the gun. Uh, so it's a, it's a society in which it's not only incarceration. The number of homicides there are in this country, it runs into thousands, I don't remember the exact figure, every year as compared to 5, 10, 12, let's say in Canada, next door, something like that. So use of the gun to settle disputes even of a very particular, you know, private nature, 
is fairly common in the United States. So that gets even more exaggerated when you have a police force, which as I was saying, is given that impunity because they need to get a certain work of law and order done. Now, <clears throat> why did <laughs> democratic society? Uh, one is that I'm not, I'm not quite sure what we mean by a democratic society. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, there's a sort of a, a classification, uh, you know, if you have, you know, elections of the sort that you have in the United States or something, you're somehow a democratic society. I don't understand what that means. India is supposed to be the world's largest democracy and so on. Uh, and you have millions of uh, working class people thrown out the, the cities and wandering around and dying on railway tracks and this, that, and the other. The great democracy carries on. And there's nobody is punished for, uh, <clears throat> for any of this. Nothing happens to the government or any, uh, any, any ministers or bureaucrats or anyone. Uh, so I don't know what kind of, uh, but, but let, let me simply um, reflect now on the question of uh, capitalism, why capitalism needs this. You know, Al Jazeera has a wonderful article, uh, a wonderful long, long piece, which has now come out as a book uh, on the ideological state apparatuses, in which he makes the point that Capitalist economy could not reproduce itself even for a year if it was left purely to economic logic. Around that economic logic, you have to have uh, <clears throat> structures of force, you have to have ideologies, you have to have ideologies that justify those structures of force. And those structures of force are built into daily life in which the state actually controls everything you do. Um, if you drive over a certain limit, the, the police can come and do anything to you. If you're white, they'll treat you one way. If you're black, they'll treat you. The, so all your life is actually regulated. If you are 15 days long, late in filing your taxes, if you forgot, forget to file a $20 payment you got from somewhere, $100 payment, etc. So these societies are full of disciplinary action. In order to, for a capitalist society, for a class society to function at all, with the kind of efficiency that is required in the peaceful way in which you're supposed to be functioning, your daily life itself has to be enveloped in structures of discipline, punishment, uncertainty, just what will happen to you, etc., and habits of obedience. Class structures cannot be reproduced without beating people into habits of obedience. You know, the most authoritarian thing in the world is capital. You know, this business of democratic societies and authoritarian societies and so on and so forth. These are nomenclatures of a very different sort. So the most authoritarian thing is when you have, everyone can see that this, uh, this virus, coronavirus, has led to a tremendous economic upheaval in the United States, which has led to 46.2 million people ap applying for 
unemployment, the government refusing to extend unemployment benefits or some 30, 35 million have lost their health insurance or are going to, to lose their health insurance in a month or so. When all of this is happening, and at the same time, the government in fact transfers some six trillion dollars to the top 0.1 percent. The how do you control popular rage? How do you control complete disorder in society? Except through demonstration in daily life over days and weeks and months and years and lifetimes of what can happen to you. Right now, I think Trump's rhetoric of throw them in for 10 years, do this. This is a you know show of the military saying if the governors and the uh, and the city governments cannot control this, I will control it through the military, etc. Et I think I think behind a number of other things which are personal to uh, to, um, to Trump. I think there's a terrible fear that this great uprising on the question of race can turn into a great uprising and a much more lasting uprising on the question of the suffering of one third of the workforce of the United States. That is what the fear is. It is in order to pre preempt that, that you need to come down as hard as you can on this uprising, which is on the lesser question. It's just a great anger about the killing of black people in this country, which is something that happens in this country all the time. So it's a particular moment of anger. They're hoping that this will pass um, and that it will not turn into something. So in all these capitalist societies, it is the fear of disobedience. It is the fear that the exploited may rise uh, in, and so on. So you, this, this, this terror, state repression, I mean, police is only one part of the thing. In fact, there are about a dozen or so um, universal, the, um, the state apparatuses of uh, paramilitary and military kinds, um, agencies which are connected both with the Department of Justice and Department of Defense, which are now in action. And there are now lawsuits asking the government to specify which of the government agencies are now out, are, are now deployed. You have now people in uniform deployed without the, any insignia of which agency they're from. Now this actually, by the laws of capitalist society itself, is illegal. But that's what they are doing. And when people ask them, show me your identity, which by according to the laws of this country, of the United States, they're allowed to do, do that. These people are saying, no, I will not tell you. I just work for the government of the United States and I'm here to defend, etc. This display of power and judicious use of violence is always there in order to preempt a moment in which you might need much more violence. And there have been times when they have up the violence. In this case, as you said, to make the bodies obedient, make the people obedient, because there is a 
um, an objective situation. I mean, you said about a third of the public uh, is unemployed. I saw a study which showed that 40% of people resident in the United States are using food kitchens. Um, the distress is deepening and I suppose that's what you're, you're referring to, is that the objective conditions for disobedience is also therefore rising. What, what I am actually saying is that <coughs> the production of the economic instance of the capitalist mode of production is not possible <coughs> without constant presence of violence, of either exercise of it or, or possibility of it. And <coughs> routinization of people <coughs> during what are called normal times, when your unemployment can be said to be 3% or 4%. <coughs> during all of those times, there has to be actual presence of the possibility of violence against people. And this is this is a generational training of psychological and doctrinal training. Uh, and and they have and they have been very successful. The habits of obedience, 2007-2008 um, financial crisis, some 10 millions or more. I don't know, remember the actual statistics, lost their homes. There was no major significant uprising. No significant demonstration. The idea that the, um, there was no demonstration in the financial crisis shows the habits of, of obedience in a way. Uh, now we are seeing also developing habits of disobedience. Uh, let's see where this takes us. Professor Ajaz Ahmed, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.